Today, we're going to talk about why superheroes wear capes and when they kind of stopped wearing them. By the way, this episode was voted on by my supporters over on Patreon. So, if you want to see more shows, I always appreciate your support and feedback over there. Let me ask you a hypothetical. If I were to ask you, envision a superhero, what comes to mind? Probably at least a skin-tight uniform to better define the musculature, right? But there's an excellent chance you also envisioned that superhero having a cape, despite the fact that relatively few superheroes actually wear a cape. So let's dig in to this obscure bit of comic book history. Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. Superheroes often wear capes, but in our day-to-day -day lives we generally do not see people wearing capes, do we? That man he's with, is he wearing a cape? <laughs> I believe he is wearing a cape. So let's take a look at the earliest superheroes that wore capes, look at the design choices and what inspired superheroes to wear those capes and the functionality that it served from both an aesthetic and a character-based perspective. Superman is arguably the most recognized and iconic superhero, debuting in 1938. There are precursors to Superman like the Phantom and the Clock, both from 1936, but Superman added sci-fi superhuman abilities and exploded in popularity. A popularity that showed real staying power over the decades, with iconic comic book runs reinterpreting the character's mythos and adaptations into radio, television, and film. When we look at the character, certainly one of the most distinctive visuals is his bright red cape. Superheroes evolved from pulp characters like The Shadow and Zorro. The heroes of pulp magazines didn't necessarily wear capes consistently, but Shadow had a flowing trench coat and Zorro would sometimes wear a small cape. Most pulp heroes did not wear capes. Doc Savage, Tarzan, John Carter of Mars were all popular pulp heroes of their time, for instance, but visually, the idea of a hero wearing a cape had been established, even if it was on a smaller level. At the same time, the pulp heroes were primarily appearing in short text stories in magazines, and the visuals were initially limited to the magazine covers. Superheroes were panel-to-panel -panel images that were primarily visual. Their look was an important element, but I would argue Superman and pulp heroes like Zorro were both using the visual ideas from the same inspiration, circus performers. In the 1920s and 1930s, performers from trapeze artists to magicians to strongmen would wear skin-tight uniforms, often with trunks over their tights which is a key visual of Superman's design. And sometimes they'd also wear capes, like this example of strongman Don Ataldo wearing one. The cape was traditionally something worn by royalty, and the strongman's visual look was meant to evoke that power and authority. There's also one more example that may have inspired superheroes wearing capes, and that is, if you look at Jewish people, a lot of the time the men will wear a long shroud over their head that's called a tali. And I mention that because a vast majority of the Golden Age comic book creators were Jewish. Siegel and Schuster created Superman. Bob Kane credited for creating uh, Batman. Uh, production studios run by guys like Will Eisner and Jerry Iger were pumping out superheroes to all sorts of publishers. I've never heard any of them specifically mention that in an interview, but it is a visual that they would have been exposed to. It's a possibility. In real life, aside from royalty from Europe to South America, capes were commonly worn in medieval Europe because it was a functional way to keep wearers both warm and dry. But by the 1930s, it was not a commonly worn item. 
when a performer like Donataldo wore one, it stood out as something special, and Superman was another early example of this being unique. So now I've talked about how capes existed in society and where some of the influences may have existed to create the idea of the superhero in the Golden Age. Now that we've discussed the visual side of it, let's talk a little bit more about the functionality side of it. Superman was created by writer Jerry Siegel and artist Joe Shuster, childhood friends who successfully pitched the idea to National Comics as comics were exploding in popularity by reprinting comic strips. Publishers at the time were eager to find new ideas to print. In a 1981 interview with the BBC, Siegel and Schuster discussed another reason why they used a cape. Jerry suggested putting on a, a cape. A cape. So that when the character cape. zooms so through the air, it would give more, flowing, more action and movement make to the it look character. Look like he's really flying. Yeah. And the very, very And of colorful. course, yeah, you added all those and additional the, things like yeah, the, yeah. the boots and the yeah. belt and the. Uh, to dig into that a little bit more, it's worth noting that printing techniques at the time on cheap newsprint paper made comics that were not capable of replicating fine detail. So a flowing cape, for example, happened to show motion with bold lines and color when comics couldn't use fine motion lines. It's fair to argue that the popularity of Superman directly led to the other notable superheroes of the Golden Age. Batman, Green Lantern, Captain Marvel. These all used similar visual shorthand while changing up the specific superpowers, characterizations, and motivations. Of these, Batman is certainly the next most influential hero after Superman, and his cape is a big part of his visual identity, but also it's functional. Batman's cape would help him glide through the air or cloak himself in the shadows. Ironically, Batman's credited creator Bob Kane initially gave Batman a more colorful design and wings based off of Leonardo da Vinci artwork before writer Bill Finger suggested a more scalloped design to evoke a bat's wings. I go into more detail on that in an episode about Bob Kane. So now we have some of our most iconic superheroes wearing capes, but was it truly a trope of the Golden Age superhero to wear capes? Is that a real archetype? It may not be as common as we think. Other popular heroes of that era included Wonder Woman, Captain America, The Flash. None of them had capes. So while we can find other early examples of heroes wearing capes like Our Man or Dr. Fate, it certainly wasn't the majority of heroes that wore them, and of these early heroes, really only Superman and Batman had continuing comics that extended past the 30s and 40s, going into the 50s and 60s. Most of the other heroes just became backup stories, if they even survived at all. Many characters like Namor or Human Torch really could not have been expected to be functional if they wore a cape. That functionality would be something more comics commented on by the Bronze Age of the 1970s and 80s. But before we get there, we need to look at the Silver Age. Superhero comics started to wane in popularity towards the end of the 1940s, going into the 50s, as the readership was getting older, and they started to shift their interests to more adult genres like sci-fi and crime, eventually romance. In the 1950s, it's worth noting, America had a huge fear of communism, the Red Scare. And a long story short, one piece of that, the fallout was that a lot of comic book publishers banded together and formed something called the Comics Code Authority. If you put that stamp on your comic, you were saying to the public, hey, there's nothing objectionable here, there's nothing to fear here. And in 1956, DC Comics decided to try superheroes again, and this time, the popularity just was explosive. In 1956, DC reimagined The Flash in Showcase number 4. That was a huge hit, and DC began bringing back more new versions of their characters, like Green Lantern. And notably, this time he did not have a cape. Marvel saw the rebirth of superheroes, and between 1961 and 1963 introduced superheroes like the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, 
Thor, Hulk, and the X-Men. Out of this massive output of new characters, only two Marvel superheroes at the time had capes. Thor, who of course was a god and his cape helped evoke his royal lineage, and Doctor Strange, who was a master of the mystic arts. His cape, beyond being something a stage magician might wear, had the functional ability of allowing Doctor Strange to levitate. As the years went on, Marvel introduced a small handful of characters who would wear capes, like Scarlet Witch and Vision. By and large, most superheroes did not wear them. Of course, there are always individual examples where the cape was still being added because it added something to the character. For instance, Storm was worshipped as a rain goddess in Africa, and her cape not only helped her stand out from her fellow X-Men, but marked her as a kind of royalty. Moon Knight's cape was part of a design that would make him stand out against the black sky, forming a crescent moon. And Cloak from Cloak and Dagger was literally a living cape who could teleport through the dark dimension. As comics moved into the 1980s, writers like Alan Moore would begin to deconstruct and analyze the ideas behind superheroes. Watchmen envisioned superheroes in a more grounded, real-world setting. In issue two, the character Dollar Bill is shown to have had his cape get caught in a revolving door which allowed bank robbers to shoot him dead. This is one of the earliest examples I can find of comic creators commenting on how the cape would not be functional in a real-world setting. The 2004 movie The Incredibles had costume designer Edna Mode insist on no capes, set to a montage of superheroes having disastrous results wearing capes. In fact, Beyond the small handful of Silver and Bronze Age characters like Doctor Strange and Moon Knight, there are very few prominent superheroes to wear capes. Many of the ones that do are derivative characters. Batman and Robin have had numerous related heroes from Huntress to Azrael to Batwing. And those are all variations on a theme. Characters like Omni-Man from Invincible and Homelander from The Boys are designed to evoke a character like Superman. The Sentry debuted in 2000 in Marvel Comics, but his story was that he was supposedly a Silver Age character who had been forgotten, and he has powers on the level of Superman. In 2008, Marvel created the Blue Marvel, but similar to a character like Icon from 1993, this is a variation on Superman, but with a black man instead of a white one. Moon Knight was a type of riff on Batman. So while there can be newer heroes, like say, Hunter's Moon in the current Moon Knight comics, they wear capes primarily to mirror the character they're spinning off from. Todd McFarlane's Spawn from 1992 might be the last major new character to not be explicitly riffing on a previous superhero who also wears a cape. And that cape is a living entity, an important part of that character's mythology. Flowing elements of a costume can still be useful. Gambit of the X-Men wears a trench coat. Ms. Marvel wears a sash. But by and large, US superheroes who are completely new are less likely to wear a cape. But there are still a few exceptions, and they seem to be intentional references to the idea of the superhero wearing a cape. Radiant Black is a newer, creator-owned superhero. Sometimes, when he really powers up, he manifests a cape. There are also recent manga that work off of the archetype of the superhero. One Punch Man is a satire of superheroes, and My Hero Academia? is very much a Japanese take on the idea of the X-Men and their students. Both have characters with capes, because the characters are meant to evoke the classic idea of a superhero. So I throw it out to you. Are there truly that many superheroes who wear capes? I would argue that it is primarily Batman and Superman and their ongoing popularity that has formed in our mind the idea that superheroes often wear capes. Because there are so many characters who are either spin-off characters from them, 
or are intentionally riffing on the idea of that character and then adding a little something new, or taking that character archetype and subverting it. Characters like Omni-Man, for instance, Homelander, things like that. I think that Batman and Superman, having lasted as long as they have, having had runs that ran through the 40s and 50s and 60s when superheroes were kind of on a lower level and now have history well over 85 years, has just ingrained through cultural osmosis the idea that superheroes wear capes. And yeah, there are plenty, but proportionally, kind of small. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts below on whether I'm missing anything huge, or just tell me what your favorite superhero is and let us know, do they wear a cape or not? Is a cape actually important to a character? I think it can look cool, but it is kind of funny. You wouldn't create these days an action movie with a character running around in a cape. It just would seem to be something that would get tangled up. I'm rambling. Hopefully you got something out of this. I had fun looking at superhero history through this very, very narrow lens. I'm stumbling over my words. So now is as good a time as any to wrap it up. I'll be back soon. Until I see you next time, keep reading comics. What the hell am I trying to say there? Oh, hi. You caught me in the middle of editing, and I have a special message for you while you watch these credits. Thank you always to my amazing supporters. Uh, my friend Godzilla Mendoza has a YouTube channel about comics, and he has recently made an episode about, I'll point that out over here, made an episode about the Fantastic Four movie from the 90s that was never released officially and never intended to be released but the actors didn't know that you should watch his video if you don't know that history it's interesting but the actors and Godzilla Mendoza have gotten together and formed this petition they're looking to see if they can get enough support to get Marvel's attention so that it could finally be formally released if you haven't seen it seen a bootleg over the years it's a charming movie it is not necessarily bad. It's low budget, but it is not bad. The people behind were behind the movie were really trying hard. And so I just wanted to uh, shout that out. I'll have a link to the petition in the description down below. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of great YouTube channels out there about comics. Uh, just always happy to shout another one out. Uh, so yeah, check that out and thank you so much for watching this episode. I will be back very soon. Uh, the next episode should be a deep dive on a, um, an amazing, amazing creator. So I'm very excited, but, uh, yeah, right back to work. I go, let's get this one up first. Bye. What does it take to interest or excite you for when you decide to collaborate? It's been awesome. We we can tear it up. Uh, we're not like pros or anything, but we definitely know what we're doing. And I've sincerely been really enjoying Project Blue Book, or, or just Blue Book. The Rampage is hilarious because it's like a little boy throwing a tantrum. You know, he's jumping on his bed, he's tearing his posters, and then in slow mo, he backhands a cup of pencils. Yes. That's whoa. Whoa. Screw you, art supplies.